Welcome to Kalemahorra with me, George Galloway, on Al Mayadeen Television, coming to you from the Islamic University in Lebanon. I've been a member of the British Parliament for more than a quarter of a century. I know I don't look that old, but I really have been. It is the scene of many crimes against the world. A quarter of the world's surface was once ruled from there and a third of all the population on the earth. But its crimes against the Arab people, which are many, have long preoccupied me. The crimes against the Arabs go back to Balfour, to Sykes and Picot, to Anthony Eden, to Tony Blair. And modern times, those crimes are still continuing. But the British Parliament never had a finer hour than the one just a few weeks ago when it stopped dead in its tracks the juggernaut for Anglo-American war against Syria. The British Prime Minister recalled the House of Commons from its holidays to try and bounce the parliamentarians into an endorsement of an American-led attack against the Syrian Arab Republic. He thought it would be a walk in the park. After many months of softening up of parliamentary and he thought public opinion, with all kind of horror stories about the nature of the regime in Damascus and a dramatic playing down of the horror stories on the other side, he thought he just had to turn up in order to win. But that was on paper. Parliament is not played on paper. When the debate began, it quickly became clear that there was no appetite at all for Britain becoming the Royal Air Force of Al-Qaeda in Syria. Moreover, everybody in the chamber knew that whilst on paper the Parliament was merely being asked to endorse a limited military strike, that if such a strike were to be launched, that we would be headlong and deep into a war of great proportions. Think Afghanistan, think Iraq. Two wars which lasted longer than the Second World War and the First World War put together. The British Parliament said no to David Cameron. The first time since 1782 that any British Prime Minister had been rejected on a matter of war and peace by his own Parliament. That would have been achievement enough, but the decision of the British Parliament stopped dead the American juggernaut also. What was about to be announced by President Obama from the Rose Garden literally had to be abandoned live on television. Instead, President Obama threw the matter over to the U.S. Congress, which itself quickly reported exactly the same story that the British parliamentarians had experienced, namely that the British and American publics had somehow seen through the fog of war propaganda on the so-called mainstream television stations and were saying no to war. Some American congressmen were reporting back that opinion in their constituencies was running at two, three, four hundred to one. Unprecedented. So British and American policy, having stopped dead, had to find somewhere else to go. And we are now in a situation where Anglo-American policy towards Syria has turned on its head. It's going in exactly the opposite direction to that which looked likely just a few weeks ago. Totally unprecedented in modern historical terms. Now, Britain and America are looking for jaw, jaw rather than war, war. Peace, talks, negotiations, and the road to Geneva too. Under American and Russian chairmanship, leading to a negotiated transition to democratic reform in Syria. 
It's what many of us called for all along. It's what Kofi Annan laid out for us long ago, 30 months and 100,000 dead people ago. It could have been the policy from the beginning, but at least it is the policy now. Arabs are suckers for conspiracy theories, in my experience, and that's because they've been the victims of many a conspiracy. Many Arabs don't believe that we really are headed for Geneva. Many Arabs don't believe that we really have experienced a dramatic change in Anglo-American policy. I, as the biggest critic of Anglo-American foreign policy in either legislature, I'm here to tell you that it's true, that it's real. They have totally misunderestimated, as George W. Bush would have put it, the strength of the regime in Damascus. They underestimated the fidelity of the Russian and Chinese positions to their stated stance on the great issue of Syria and the war. They underestimated the Syrian people and they did not account for the fact that fanatic extremism, Al-Qaeda, would become so dominant in the so-called Syrian opposition that their own public opinion would want to turn its face away. British and American public opinion have absolutely no stomach for their money and their men, materiel and weapons, being used to bring Al-Qaeda to power in Damascus. So we are headed for Geneva. Who will be there negotiating on the other side remains to be seen. It might be a long process. Oslo is 20 years old. It may take a long time, but we've turned decisively away from war waged by Western countries directly towards a path to negotiation. That's my point of view. Let's hear what the point of view of our expert audience here at the Islamic University in Lebanon have to say. The Secretary General of the University, Dr. Nasrallah, is with us. So no one is better to kick us off than that. Doctor, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Galloway. And the Halla and Sharafna in Marathania, Fi Al Jamia Al Islamia, Fi Lubnan, Wa Murahab Bikum, Wa Murahab Aidan Bi Baritania, Wa Genev Tnain, Wa Hatha Mokif Aidan Baritani, Daim Li Al Mufawadat, Wa Al Had. أو توقيف الحرب في سوريا عبر المفاوضات في جنيف 2 وأن الحروب التي لها أكثر من سنتين ونصف في سوريا والتي يشترك فيها معظم دول العالم بطريقة مباشرة أو غير مباشرة هذه الحرب لا يمكن أن تؤدي إلى نتيجة ولا يمكن لفريق أن ينتصر انتصار عسكري على فريق آخر وأن الحل هو بالمفاوضات وبوقف القتال والتوصل إلى حل سلمي سياسي بين المجموعات في سوريا وهذا الموقف أيضا البريطاني الداعم لجنيف 2 هو أيضا موقف مشكور وأعتقد بأن التوجه, التوجه العام لكل الخيرين في العالم هو باتجاه هذه المفاوضات المباشرة التي ليس لها شروط مسبقة والتي تؤدي إلى الحل السياسي للأزمة في سوريا وهي ولعله هو الحل المنشود وشكرا. Well, I can see why you're the head of this university. A tremendously erudite introduction to this debate. I have some issues with it, and I'll express those right after this.
Welcome back. You're watching Kali Mahorra with me, George Galloway, for Al Mayadeen Television here at the Islamic University in Lebanon. Before the break, the head of the university, Dr. Nasrallah, in a tremendously erudite contribution, and with great Arabic courtesy and manners, praised the role of Britain in this current part of the crisis with Syria. But as we say in English, Doctor, you were too kind. Because, of course, the British government is now supporting Geneva too, only because the British people would not accept more and deeper involvement in the war in Syria. But our involvement continues, and it's a very bad involvement. For a start, Britain is still giving money and materiel to the so-called opposition in Syria, the dominant factors in which are Al-Qaeda and other associated fanatic groups. We have given hundreds of millions of pounds to these people in a country that is almost bankrupt and which can't keep its old people warm in the winter time, but has money to give to set fire to Aleppo and Damascus and other great cities in Syria. Secondly, the British are still insisting on preconditions at the talks in Geneva. The first and most important of which is patently ridiculous. They are still saying that there can be no role for the Syrian President Bashar al-Assad coming out of the negotiations in Geneva. Well, this would be an absurd demand even if the war was going in the opposite direction to that which it is going. Even if the opposition were winning the war, a foreign country making this precondition would be unacceptable. But in fact, the opposition are losing the war, as everyone in the world can see. The British are insisting on a military status quo before Geneva. This also is ridiculous. You cannot say to a government, in the case uh, that we're talking about, Bashar al-Assad's government, you may not retake any towns, any cities, any territory that has fallen to foreign elements that have been sent in to invade your country. So whilst I freely acknowledge the history lesson that you gave us and the importance, I'd be the last person to deny it, of this turn in British policy, we still have some way to go before the British policy can be praised quite as generously as you praised it, in my opinion. Let's hear uh, from the rest of the people in the audience. Yes, sir, go ahead. Mohamed Al-Ogla, I'm the President of the United States of the United States of the United States of Syria. First of all, I want to welcome you to the Islam Society in Lebanon. وبدي أحكي بداية على أول ما بلشنا من جنيف واحد الدولة السورية التزمت بجنيف واحد من تغيير للدستور وحرية الصحافة ما أمكن ومن الالتزام بحماية البعثة الدبلوماسية البعثة الدولية الدبلوماسية والتعاون معها وتغيير للحكومة السورية وإشراك المعارضين لكن الشرفاء المعارضين الشرفاء الذين قلبهم على الوطن لكن كل هذه الأمور التي خرج بها جنيف واحد لم تتحقق على أرض الواقع لأن كان هناك خرق من قبل الجماعات الإسلامية والإرهابية الجماعات المتطرفة في سوريا لأنها لم تلتزم بإيقاف القتال لذلك خرجنا من جنيف واحد ولم نحقق أي حل للأزمة في سوريا لذلك كان لابد هناك من أن نتطلع إلى حل جديد نخرج به من هذه الأزمة التي تعاني منها الدولة السورية والتطلعات حاليا والتوجهات نحو مؤتمر جنيف 2 أنا برأيي كمواطن سوري أن جنيف 2 هو المدخل الوحيد للحل السياسي للأزمة السورية بل أن الحوار السوري السوري هو مفتاح حل هذه الأزمة لكن بشرط توفر النوايا الصادقة لحل هذه الموضوع وهناك تساؤل يطرح كمواطن سوري أطرحه عليك هل مؤتمر جنيف 2 الغاية من حله الغاية من عقده هل هو 
التوصل في حقيقة الأمر إلى حل للأزمة السورية أم هل هو إعادة إنتاج وصاية جديدة على الدولة السورية ونحن نعرف أن الدولة السورية فرضت في هذا الوقت معادلة ذهبية ثمينة وترجمتها على أرض الواقع وهو وهي الحوار بالحوار والسلاح بالسلاح من يريد حوارا فعليه أن يسهم في عقد جنيف 2 ومن يريد غير ذلك فالجيش العربي السوري بالمرصاد سوف يكون لكل من تسول له العبث بأمن الوطن والمواطن وفي, وفي في الحقيقة في هذه الفترة الجيش السوري هو من يملك الأرض وهو من سوف يذهب إلى جنيف 2 لكي يحقق الحل السياسي للشعب السوري أما بالنسبة لتبدل وتغير الموقف البريطاني حيال الأزمة السورية من توجيه ضربة على سوريا فأنا برأيي كمواطن سوري بأن بريطانيا ومن ورائها كل دول الحلف الغربي كانت تدرك بأن انعكاسات هذه الضربة ستجر الويلات الكثيرة على بريطانيا وأمريكا وربيبتها إسرائيل في المنطقة فيما لو حدثت وأيضا البريطانيون والدولة البريطانية أدركوا بأن الدولة السورية تحقق انتصارات على أرض الواقع أضف إلى ذلك أن الدولة السورية تقوم بقتال جماعات إسلامية متطرفة في حال لو تم إسقاط النظام برأيها هذه الجماعات الإسلامية المتطرفة لن تعترف بشيء من الجميل الذي قدمه لها الغرب من تسهيل من التمويل وتسهيل دخول السلاح إلى سوريا أضف إلى ذلك أن الجماعات الإسلامية المتطرفة تنتشر بسرعة وفي الدول المجاورة في المستقبل لن يكون من السهل السيطرة عليها والدليل على ذلك ما أنها تنتشر بسهولة وبسرعة ما حصل في الفترة القليلة الماضية من تفجير جسر يربط بين العراق والأردن أضف إلى كل هذه الأمور بأن بريطانيا لم يكن من مصلحتها توجيه ضربة على سوريا لأن وجود هذه الجماعات الإسلامية المتطرفة أصبح يهدد أمن تركيا وفقا ما ذكرته تقارير أمنية وصحفية تركية في بدي يضيف شغلة بالأخير أنه الموقف الإيراني لعب دور كتير كبير بالشيء اللي عم يصير بتوجيه الضربة آه نحن نعرف أنه السياسة اللي كانت تنتهجها آه إيران في ظل حكم الرئيس أحمد نجاد هو التهديد لأمريكا ولإسرائيل ولكن في ظل حكم الشيخ حسن الروحاني بعد توليه الحكم في إيران نجد أنه أصبح ينتهج سياسة جديدة ويسعى لاتباع سياسة جديدة وهي التصالح مع الغرب فهل من المعقول في هذا الوقت إيران تحاول أن تحسن علاقتها بالغرب يأتي الغرب أن يضرب أحد الحلفاء الموجودين لإيران في المنطقة وهو سوريا في النهاية أود أن أسأل سؤال هل الديمقراطية والإصلاح الذي نريد تطبيقه في سوريا يطبق يفرض بقوة بهذه الطريقة الهمجية البربرية التي تتعامل بها المجموعات الإرهابية المسلحة هذا السؤال برسم أصحاب الحقوق والحريات في العالم وشكرا uh, Well I'm going to disappoint you with the last point Syria vitally needs democratic reform However that has come about there is now a widespread recognition in Syria that things cannot go back to how they were before The one party state is no more not in syria not anywhere nowhere in the world no one will accept a state where one party one group dictates to the rest of the polity so i'm very clear about this the syrian people not less than any other people deserve representative government that they choose freely and that they can remove freely so that's what I want out of Geneva too. But on the other points that you made, I agreed almost entirely. I just have to point this out to you. The decision of the British Parliament was by a margin of just 13 votes. This means just seven members had to change their mind. If seven members changed their mind one way, now we would have a war between Britain and America, Syria, Iran, Russia, China, Hezbollah, all over the region, and maybe all over the world. We would have been in a war, but for 
just seven members of the British Parliament. In fact, it went the other way. We persuaded seven people to change their mind, and that's why we had the majority of 13 that we did. So, the British state was obviously not clear about where its real interests lay. And this is because, as I put it in my introduction, first they believed that the Syrian regime was weak, that the Syrian president was weak, that the Syrian people would not stand by their regime and their president, that the Syrian army would break, and that sectarianization, which was their strategy from the beginning, would lead to an early collapse of the Syrian state and its president. Turkey, Davidullu and uh, Erdogan were predicting in one week Bashar will fall, in one month Bashar will fall, in six weeks Bashar will fall. Over and over and over again he predicted this. So they underestimated the strength of the Syrian state and the unity of the Syrian people who may or may not like Bashar, they may or may not like the regime, but they like the Takfiri fanatics even less. And they like the idea of the state being smashed into pieces like Iraq and elsewhere even less. Secondly, they underestimated Russia and China, which had been deceived by them over the Libyan question and they were determined not to be deceived again. And thirdly, they did not take into account in a democracy the state of public opinion. So I, as one of the leaders of the anti-war movement who fought and led the struggle against the war in Iraq, can say this. We did not stop the war on Iraq. We failed to stop the war on Iraq, but we definitely stopped the war on Syria by the grace of God and by the wisdom of the British people, despite the fog of war propaganda in their media and the deceptions of their political class. I'll be back with the next section right after this. You're watching Kali Mahorra with me, George Galloway, on Al Mayadeen Television, coming to you from the Islamic University in Lebanon, discussing British and American policy towards Syria and towards Geneva. Is Geneva going to be the solution to what has been a desperate and bloody conflict? I've got some experts with me this evening, so let's hear from them. Doctor, where, where do you think uh, we're going here? Is Geneva going to work or not? دكتور غادي مقلد مدير شؤون الطلاب بالجامعة الإسلامية أولا منذ بداية الأحداث في سوريا والجميع يتحدث عن حلول سياسية يتحدثون عن حلول سياسية وفي الواقع على أرض الميدان تشتد المعارك حدة عقدوا جنيف واحد عقدوا مؤتمر لأصدقاء سوريا مؤتمرات هنا وهناك في اسطنبول في أنقرة ولم يتركوا مكان في العالم إلا وعقدوا مؤتمر من أجل إيجاد حل سياسي في سوريا من المفهوم أن النظام في سوريا لديه جيش يقاتل بجانبه وهذا أمر طبيعي فهذا نظام يمتد منذ أربعين عام وبالتالي كون منظومة عسكرية تدافع عنه اليوم في ظل الأزمة التي يمر بها الغير مفهوم كيف استطاعت هذه المعارضات المسلحة أن تتنامى بهذه القوة وتتعاظم وتصبح جيشا يواجه جيشا في سوريا وأن تغيرت اليوم الميدان كما هو وقائع الميدان كما هو معلوم في ظل الموقفين الدوليين المختلفين بين معسكر الروسي الإيراني الصيني السوري طبعا والمعسكر الآخر المتمثل بالولايات المتحدة الأمريكية وبريطانيا وفرنسا ودول الغرب اشتدت حدة النقاش السياسي والجميع ثابت في موقفه إلى أن تبدلت الوقائع على الأرض وبدأ واضحا بأن المعسكر الذي يشمل الولايات المتحدة وبريطانيا وفرنسا معسكر الغربي بدأ يتراجع فرنسا غير متعودة على هذا النوع من المواقف لا تستطيع الثبات 
غير لديها ليس لديها الخبره الكافيه لاستكمال ما بداته في سوريا او ما بداته في ليبيا حتى فرنسا ضعيفه في هذا المجال امريكا لديها هدف واحد فقط لا غير هو اسرائيل ولا تهتم الا لامن اسرائيل بريطانيا هنا كان الموقف المحير مصالح بريطانيا في المنطقة غير واضحة عدائها لسوريا غير واضح نفهم الولايات المتحدة لماذا تعادي سوريا ولكن عداء بريطانيا لفرنز... لسوريا غير واضح فاجأنا كثيرا الموقف لبريطانيا في البداية فاجأنا كيف نظمت الحكومة البريطانية مكاتب سفر لرحلات مجانية للمجاهدين من بريطانيا إلى سوريا كيف فتحت الحدود كيف بدأت تتوقع مثلها مثل تركيا مثلها مثل دول الخليج حتى خيل لنا أنها دولة في الخليج بريطانيا عندما بدأت تتوقع سقوط النظام خلال يوم ويومين وأسبوع في رمضان ثم في آخر السنة إلى ما هنالك اليوم الجميع يذهب إلى جنيف اثنين الجميع يريد الحل السياسي ولكن حل سياسي يتطلب إيقاف العمليات العسكرية كما كان لبريطانيا الشجاعة المطلقة تحت ضغط الرأي العام البريطاني بأن الشجاعة المطلقة لها أسباب لها أسباب الخوف والتردد والرأي العام أكيد شدت من حماسها تجاه الضربة العسكرية وبالتالي أوقفت العمليات العسكرية الخارجية التي كانت سوف تشن على سوريا يجب على بريطانيا أن تتحمل مسؤوليتها وأن تضغط باتجاه إيقاف العمليات العسكرية الداخلية في سوريا أولا من خلال حلفائها في المنطقة تركيا ودول الخليج بوقف ضخ الأموال والسلاح إلى سوريا ثانيا بريطانيا لديها القدرة لديها القدرة على رسم مسودة مشروع حل سياسي في سوريا يكون موضوعي غير مبني على رحيل النظام وعلى عدم ترشح الرئيس بشار الأسد إلى ما هنالك حل موضوعي أنا لا أقول إلغاء المعارضة أبدا وإنما إيجاد حل سياسي لأن الوحيد الذي يدفع الثمن اليوم في سوريا ليس النظام ليست بريطانيا ليست فرنسا هو الشعب السوري الشعب الذي كان يحتضن آلاف الشعوب الذي كان يحتضن آلاف العرب في أثناء محنتهم اليوم نجده مشتت في جميع أنحاء العالم هل بريطانيا فعلا لديها النية بإيجاد حل سياسي في جنيف 2 أم فقط جنيف 2 هو لالتقاط المزيد من الصور التذكارية yeah. وشكرا well, uh, The British policy towards Syria of course was only very recently very different President Bashar al-Assad was invited by the Queen to lunch and he slept in Buckingham Palace with his wife in the Queen's spare bedroom and the British were throwing flowers at him and saying he was the future uh, for the Arab world. How did Britain change? I have to be blunt. A scorpion stings because it's a scorpion. And an imperialist country behaves like an imperialist country because it's an imperialist country. However long there has been some democratic check and balance against its rulers, however long its empire has faded, it's still an imperialist country. It still wants to protect the interests of Israel. It still wants to be a part of an imperialist alliance that will steal the wealth of the Arabs, which is very considerable wealth. 18% of London, 18, almost one-fifth, is owned by an Arab Gulf country, including some of the most important landmarks. So we are doing very well out of the Arab world. We are taking the wealth that God gave to the Arabs to invest in our cities, in our economies, spend in our arms bazaars, in our casinos and all the other ways in which this money is wasted. And Britain wants this. And it saw the opportunity of Syria with its influence in other countries also. And the oil and gas which now we know lies off the shelf of Lebanon, Palestine, Syria. A huge treasure trove of oil and gas. And it wants this. It wants to be sure that this wealth will also be spent in London and invested in London. So please, don't be too kind. 
Let's take uh, the young woman behind you, please. السلام عليكم. أول شيء بحب رحب فيك دكتور بتاني مرة تشرف لعنا الجامعة الإسلامية. Say your name, please. ماريانا السيد أحمد كلية الاقتصاد وإدارة الأعمال. مر وقت طويل على الأزمة السورية ونحن نشوف أطفال ودماء شهداء ومن النهر. طبعا نحن مع الحل السياسي و... وضد العنف وضد ال... الحل العسكري ما له منفعة حيكون آه بس آه مر آه عقد جناف واحد وما استفدنا شيء آه هلأ ناطرين جناف اثنين ونتمنى انه خير بس نتوقع كمان انه ما يمشي الحال آه حضرتك شو بتتوقع يعني لمؤتمر جنيف اثنين؟ آه وشو آه رايك يعني بمصير الجماعات التكفيريه الارهابيه اللي عم تجي من الدول الغربيه؟ وهل برايك نجح محور المقاومه في التصدي للازمه السوريه اللي هي طبعا مش ثوره هي مؤامره كبيره علينا؟ شكرا. Well the the uh, British and Americans and others are about to find out what happened at the end of the great novel Frankenstein. Dr. Frankenstein built himself a monster. But once he built the monster, he realized why it's called a monster. Because you can't control it once you have created it. And Dr. Frankenstein's monster consumed him and consumed everything around him. And this is the big problem that they now have and is one of the main reasons why they have changed their tack. They saw, as the uh, doctor just said, how dramatically this phenomenon mushroomed. First thousands, then tens of thousands, then scores of thousands, then maybe 100,000 armed fanatics who cut off people's heads and eat their hearts and murder people for the smallest difference, even within their own sect of their own religion, never mind small differences with other religions. The problem they have now is that this 100,000 fanatics are all dressed up with nowhere to go. So where will they go? Well, some will go back to their own countries, Britain, France, the United States, Holland, Belgium, they will go back there and they will try to cut people's heads off there. They will blow themselves up on trains there. They will re-import into their own countries the fanaticism they tried to export to Syria. This is a catastrophic blunder. It's a crime. But as Talleyrand said, it's a crime, but it's worse than a crime. It's a blunder. It's a gigantic mistake, and they will pay. We, our people, will pay for this uh, crime, for this blunder. I don't know when Geneva II will meet or when it will end, but I'm certain it's going to meet, and I'm sure that it will, of course, end. Why? The reason Geneva I didn't succeed is because they believed they could win the war. So why to negotiate if you can win on the battlefield everything that you want? But they failed in this. And they, we should not underestimate this point. They have comprehensively failed. The regime in Damascus is not going to fall. Definitely not. 100% certain not. So what to do? If you cannot defeat the enemy that you spent 30 months and billions of dollars and all this blood, if you cannot defeat it, well, you have to try and talk your way out of the situation that you have. So, my guess is that Al-Qaeda just in today's newspapers threatened to kill anybody who goes to Geneva from the Syrian opposition side. So maybe some will go, some will not go. Maybe none will go, but the Syrian government will be there. The American and Russian governments will be there. And it's up to them to tell their clients in the Gulf who are paying the money for all of this, you better bring your clients to the negotiating table.
It might be a long wait. There will still be a lot of blood, a lot of bombs, a lot of heads being cut off. Sure, but the tide has turned and is now moving inexorably, ineluctably, away from the Syrian rebels. And I hope that the Syrian government will act wisely at Geneva, will make it clear to the world that they are serious about reform and change inside their country so that the blame for any delays in Geneva lie with the other side and not with them. Who's next? Yes, sir. Yes. Go ahead, sir. Bashar al-Ahmad, Adu, Qiyat al-Tihad al-Watan li talba al-Suriya fara al-Ibnan. بات من المعلوم ومن الواضح أن الأزمة السورية تأخذ حيز كبير على السياسة العالمية بشكل عام سواء كان إقليميا أو دوليا ونجد بعد فشل عدة مؤتمرات قامت بهذا الخصوص إلى أن وصلنا إلى جنيف 2 ونرى أن الإبراهيمي حاليا يجري المفاوضات بين دول هنا وهناك لأجل إنشاء هذا المؤتمر أو التوصل إلى عقد هذا المؤتمر لكن في عندما نرى أو ننظر في المدى المنظور نجد أن ليس هناك موعد محدد أو لن يتحدد في الوقت المنظور لموعد جنيف 2 وذلك لوجود عدة ثغرات سواء كانت هذه الثغرات على مستوى إقليمي أو دولي ولو أخذنا الشق الأول على المستوى الإقليمي نجد أن السعودية بسياستها المعهودة نجد أنها هي أحد الأسباب التي تمنع من إنشاء هذا المؤتمر أو الوصول إلى هذا المؤتمر ونحن كما نعلم أن السياسة السعودية هي علاقة تابع بمتبوع بالسياسة الأمريكية وننظر نجد أن هناك أن أمريكا حاليا تسعى إلى تقارب إيراني وأن تبدي آراء جيدة حول, حول أنهاء الأزمة في سوريا فلماذا نجد حاليا أن الوضع السعودي يعتبر أحد الأسباب التي تؤدي إلى فشل هذا المؤتمر علما أن هناك تقارب بين السياسة الأمريكية والسعودية هذا من جهة ومن جهة ثانية كما عهدنا أيضا بريطانيا هي تكون دائما في الصف الأمريكي أو في صف السياسة الأمريكية لماذا بريطانيا غيرت من رأيها في الوقت في المرحلة الراهنة تجاه الأزمة من سوريا ما هي الأسباب التي جعلت بريطانيا أن تغير من رأيها أو من موقفها وما هي العوامل الأساسية لنجاح مؤتمر جنيف 2 ما هي العوامل الأساسية التي يرتكز عليها للوصول إلى حل سلمي في سوريا بعد أن بات واضحا لدى الجميع لا حل عسكري في سوريا وشكرا Well these are very big and important questions but I'll have to deal with them after the break You're watching Kale Mahorra with me, George Galloway, on Al-Mayadeen Television at the Islamic University in Lebanon, discussing Syria and, in particular, the British and American policy towards it, how it has changed, why it has changed, and what it means for Geneva, too. Before the break, a young man asked me some very pointed, pungent questions about the process from here on in. In particular, he asked about the continued opposition to any rapprochement, any negotiated solution among some countries that are currently paying big money for the war in Syria. He named some countries in the Gulf and raised the question that they intend to continue business as usual. It's true that the American relationship to those countries and others is a master client relationship but sometimes the client wants to show some independence cannot accept the decisions being made by the master this happened for example with Mubarak it's not a direct relationship in the sense that Obama just has to pull and all the actors jerk uh, automatically in the way that he would want it's not as clear-cut it's not as methodical as that but at the end the tail never wags the dog the dog always 
wags the tail. And that's what will happen in relationship to the countries that you mentioned. If the Americans are serious, and I believe they are, about a rapprochement with Iran, about not directly intervening in the war in Syria for the reasons we've all been talking about tonight, their allies will have to fall into line. And that's already happening with at least one of the Gulf countries that have spent so much money, effort in producing this enormous wave of bloodshed in Syria. The destruction that they have caused is unforgivable in my opinion. But people are already beginning to change their tune in the Gulf and elsewhere, closer to home also. And that process, I believe, will accelerate in the weeks and months to come. At least I hope so. Let's take uh, this young lady in the middle there. Yes, Madam, uh, go on. Saja Azzuddin. من فترة تم القبض على غرفة عمليات عسكرية في منطقة في منطقة سفيرة شرقية حلب تديرها مخابرات أمريكية تركية بتمويل قطري سعودي وهذا كله تراكمات من تراكمات لأن الحدود التركية مفتوحة فهل مؤتمر جنيف اثنين رح يخرج بقرار يلزم الحكومة التركية على تسكير حدودها أو لا؟ well, I think that the Turkish government is particularly vulnerable to American pressure. And if the United States is serious, and I believe that it now is, then you will begin to see a change in the policy of Turkey towards the uh, insurgency in Syria. For a number of reasons, not just direct American disapproval, but also because this policy towards Syria has been a disaster for Erdogan and has imperiled his entire political project. A project which began under the slogan, no conflicts with the neighbors, which became conflicts with all the neighbors, problems with all the neighbors. He maximized the opposition to himself in Turkey and that led to the tremendous disorder and violence and death and destruction in Turkey just a few months ago, which we covered here on this show on al Maidin, And because the military balance has so shifted that Turkey has to recognize that reality. And lastly, because as was said earlier, this phenomenon of fanaticism is a danger to Turkey also because these fanatics may turn against him, may turn against other people who are paying them. After all, where did this phenomenon come from? It started in the 1980s in Afghanistan. It was paid for by Gulf countries through Egypt under Sadat, but ordered by Britain and the United States. This whole Al-Qaeda phenomenon was conjured up by them on the principle that my enemy's enemy is my friend. But they discovered on 9-11 and before it that your enemy's enemy is sometimes worse than your enemy. And if you make your enemy's enemy stronger, he may become more dangerous to you than your enemy already was. And so I think that that will occur uh, to, to the Turkish policy, that same check is now underway in uh, Turkey. We'll see if I'm right. We'll cover it here uh, on this show. But I'm optimistic, as will be clear already, because I'm sh I, mainly because I'm sure of one thing, that the attempt to destroy Syria has failed. The attempt to destroy another important Arab country has failed. The attempt to atomize the Arabs into sectarian sect and statelets has failed. And I thank God every day for this. Who's next? Yes, yes, sir, go ahead. Hisham Sannan, Kuliyat al Hukuk. Kithar al Hadith bil Fatra al Akhira and Akad Motamar Janifitan. Will the Ajmat dual Kubra Killa bil Mihwaran ala and Akadu. لكن بالمقابل سمعنا عن لسان وزير المتحدث باسم الخارجية الروسية أن هناك 19 منظمة 
19 مجموعة تشارك بالقتال بسوريا أعلنت رفضة لهذا المؤتمر وأنها بدأت تستمر بالقتال فهل تعتقد أن هذه المجموعات بدأت تتمرد على مموليها ومن اخترعها وخلقها كما حصل في أفغانستان وهل تعتقد أن الحل السياسي الذي يمكن أن يتوصل إليه جنيف 2 سيتحقق في ظل رفض هذه المجموعات لهذا الحال واستمرارها في القتال Shukran. Well, uh, those who continue the war will be met by the Syrian Arab army, uh, which is dealing uh, with them. And that's why I say there will be no easy solution to this, no bloodless solution to this. But if they continue to fight and destroy Syria, they will be met by equal and opposing violence from the state. And I believe that that state uh, opposition and resistance to them will prevail. But in the end, an automobile needs gasoline to move. And if the gasoline, in this case money, is progressively turned off, then they will decide to move elsewhere. Go back to their own countries, go back to Chechnya, to Libya, to Pakistan, to Britain and European countries and so on and they will cause mayhem there, or they will move to another so-called jihad somewhere else. Libya is the place where the West thought that they were very smart. They overthrew the dictatorship of Gaddafi and they achieved the apparently impossible of making Libya even worse than it was under Gaddafi. And now nowhere is safe, not for the Prime Minister of Libya, not for the American ambassador in Libya. Nowhere is safe from the madness and violence uh, of these uh, people. So they will go elsewhere uh, when they run out of gasoline in Syria. But one thing's for sure, they know now that the tide has turned. They know that they are not going to prevail and that this is not uh, uh, the end, but it is the beginning of the end of their attempt to destroy the Syrian Arab Republic. Yes, uh, yes sir, go ahead. Welcome again uh, in Islamic University of Lebanon, Mr. Galloway, Ali Abu Milhim, Handels Computer Tisalat, third year. Raina fi Britannia al-mawqif demokrati silmi al-jadid, hay sukana mawqif idai للنظام السوري وعبر دعم المنظمات الإرهابية عبر مقاتلين وسلاح ودعم معنوي وقد تبين هذا الموقف الجديد من من تصريح رئيس الوزراء بأنه خاضع بأنه خاضع لرغبة الشعب بعدم توجيه ضربة لسوريا وبدعم مؤتمر جنيف 2 فهل هذا فهل هذا التغير هو صادر عن أن بريطانيا تريد الخروج بأقل خسائر من سوريا بعد أن تحول الشق العسكري لصالح لصالح النظام وشكل حصار وتشكيل حصار على المتطرفين وما موقف بريطانيا أمام حلفائها في هذا الموقف السلمي الديمقراطي الذي في الموقف السلمي الديمقراطي الذي تبينه إلى سوريا شكرا well, first of all, the British state uh, did not change its character. It only changed its clothes. This is very important to understand. As I said earlier, a scorpion stings because it's a scorpion. The British have suffered a major setback for all the reasons we've been discussing here, but they have not accepted it with uh, grace. The British are still training fanatic forces in Jordan, for example, uh, who they hope will uh, still be involved on the battlefield in Syria. The British are still giving uh, money and material. They say they are not giving weapons, but if you give money, you are giving weapons. Because what are they spending the money on except weapons and to make their war uh, possible? They're still doing all of that. They are still demanding preconditions as if they had won the war as if they had uh, the military advantage when everybody knows on the ground that the opposite is true. So I think the British want out of the potential conflict with the least loss of face. 
and they'll be encouraged by how many of you are accepting their change this evening. I don't feel the same generosity of spirit towards the British as you do. It's very gallant and very Arabic of you to do so. I'm bitter that they almost, but for 13 votes, they almost took us into an unparalleled disaster. So I think such people are not fit to rule my country, even if they now have had to change their, uh, their tune. I asked David Cameron in Parliament, not six months ago, when they announced they were going into Mali, I asked the Prime Minister, can he adumbrate for the House the key differences, just the key differences between the Al-Qaeda we were going to Mali to kill and the Al-Qaeda in Syria that we were giving money and weapons to help them to kill. Of course, he had no answer because there is no answer. Al-Qaeda is Al-Qaeda is Al-Qaeda. The reality is that the British and the American positions have changed because they have failed. They failed to persuade their own public opinion for another war. In America, just 13%, one three, were in favor of a strike on Syria. This means 87% were not. In Britain, the figure was 11. 11% in a country that once was ready to attack and invade and occupy almost anybody almost any time that had an empire so huge that upon it the sun never set because God would never trust the British in the dark. They failed because they failed to properly calculate the strength of the Syrian state and the resolve of its people to remain united and to reject extremism. They thought that Syria would be another Libya. And then it became clear that it would not be. They failed because they thought that Russia in particular would fold under the bribery and bullying. There was one Arab leader went to President Putin and offered him money as if he was a cheap thief in the bazaar that you can buy. And Putin told him to leave and not to insult Russia, a great power, in such a way. They failed to persuade the Chinese, whom they thought would fold. The Chinese foreign ministry told the British foreign minister, William Hague, don't call us again. There is no point in calling us. And he said this, Haig told me this. The Chinese foreign minister told William Haig, there are no circumstances, none, in which China will support an attack against Syria. So they failed on all of these fronts. And when you fail so comprehensively as that, the only way is backwards. The only road is retreat. I'll be back with the last segment of Kali Mahorra just after this. Welcome back to Kali Mahorra with me, George Galloway, for Al Maidin Television here at the Islamic University in Lebanon, discussing Syria with a very wise audience indeed of professors and students at the Islamic University. Let's take another of the students. Yes, madam. Fatin Moussawi, Kuliyat Lalum al Funun. Hal Satapka Saudiya, Rafida, Al Hal Siasi, Fi Suriya, Wahal Satapka, Tuathir Ala Al Jamaat, Al Mutatarifa, Wal Mu'arada, Al Suriya, Li Adam Hudur Hadal Mu'tamar. Well, uh, I think that the position of several Gulf countries will now have to change. These countries are utterly dependent upon the United States for their very existence of these regimes. These regimes would not last five minutes if it were not for the military and political and diplomatic support 
uh, for these countries. The one you mentioned, where women are not allowed to drive motor cars, could not continue to have this regime if it were not for the support of the United States. So I don't believe that the U.S. will accept for long the policy of some of these countries uh, towards this conflict if the United States has made a strategic shift. Uh, but of course there will be a time lag. And of course these groups already have lots of money. They already have lots of weapons, lots of explosives. And they have lots of knives that they can cut people's throats with. And this will continue, I'm sorry to say, for a very long time in Syria, as it did in the Algerian war, for example, which lasted many, many years, 10 years at least, of this kind of fanaticism before it was finally defeated. But in the end, this kind of war needs the wherewithal to fuel it. And if there is no fuel, then in the end, I think that uh, they will run out of steam. Yes, the gentleman next to you. Hassan Rashid, Kuliyat Idarat Al-Amal. من أبو تعرف عليه أن من يملك القرار على الأرض والقوة على الأرض يتحكم بالقرار على الطاولة وقد رأينا هذا من خلال بعد معركة معركة الكسار عندما انعكست نتائجها إيجابيا لصالح النظام السوري والآن جميع الأنظار تتجه نحو الكلامون نظرا للموقع الاستراتيجي وتمركز الجماعات الأصولية فيها فهل بريطانيا والولايات المتحدة تنتظر نتائج هذه المعركة لتحديد قرارها في مؤتمر جنيف اثنان شكرا well, the position of the British government is to freeze the military status quo uh, before going to Geneva. Uh, but this is impossible. It's an impossible condition. You cannot ask any government, any state, to allow the presence of foreign fanatics armed by foreign governments, financed by foreign governments, to hold territory if you can take that territory back. And in the coming battle, which I'm sure uh, will uh, continue to be a major priority for the Syrian government, uh, I expect the same military result as happened in Qusir. And I hope that Syria can be liberated from these people as comprehensively and as quickly as possible. Not because I want Syria to go back to how it was, before 30 months ago. I don't. Maybe there are some who do, but I don't. I want change in Syria. Syria needs change, but that doesn't mean that we can agree that these extremist fanatics were a danger to everybody. Everybody with the slightest, remotest difference from themselves, even their own comrades, they are murdering each other because of control of resources, because of slight doctrinal uh, points between them, these people can have no part in the future of Syria or any part of the Muslim Ummah, in my opinion. Yes, sir, doctor. The United States of Syria is in Lebanon, in the Iraq war. The United States of Syria is usually in the political parties. It is not to stand on the political parties, but to stand on the political parties alone. عندما اجتمع مجلس العموم البريطاني وقرر حجب الثقة عن الضربة العسكرية على سوريا لم يكن ذلك ناتجا من الديمقراطية وإنما كان ناتج بسبب المعرفة بقدرة الجيش السوري والعلاقات التشابكية التي بنتها القيادة مع الأحلاف لذلك فقدت الثقة الشعوب العربية دائما بالقيادات الغربية منذ احتلال فلسطين حتى اليوم لم يكن هناك أي قرار يخدم هذا يخدم العرب يخدم العرب اليوم يجاهرون بحرية الشعب السوري والشعب السوري اليوم يقاتل إلى جانب القيادة وإلى جانب الجيش من أجل حرية القرار السياسي لأنه يعلم إذا كان قراره السياسي مرونا بالخارج فهو عبيد لهم فقل لهم يا سيد يا سيد العزيز هكذا قال السوري وهكذا قال العربي إن لم, تكون أح... إن لم تكونوا أحرارا في أمة حرة فعار عليكم حرية الأمم وشكرا Well, uh, you're absolutely correct not to have any faith in Western governments. These Western governments are not acting as they do for you. 
they're acting for themselves and the small class of rich and powerful people that they represent. Otherwise, Palestine would have been freed decades ago, indeed would never have been in chains in the first place, would never have been wiped off the map in the first place. These Western scorpions are stinging where they can sting and running away when they cannot sting uh, anymore. But it was a very close thing, I beg you to understand this. It came down to four speeches, one of which was mine, two of which came from Jewish members of the British Parliament. One, two, three, four. The last of the four was mine. It was these four speeches which turned the debate. Otherwise, we would now be in a war and blood would be everywhere. Explosions would be everywhere. That's how close it was. So with respect to you, it was in the end for us about democracy. It was for us, the people saying, the government cannot do what it wants. It must do what we want. This was the message of the Magna Carta in 1215. This was the message of the English Revolution in the 17th century. Neither of these two occasions completed the job, and we have not completed the job. We still have an imperialist government, and the next one will also be an imperialist government. But we demonstrated that where the people are united and determined, they can stop a big crime uh, being committed. Let's go to, yes, with yes. the glasses. Yes, sir, go ahead. Hassan Hajjaj, Talib B'Kuliyat Al-Idara. Hal say kun Muqtama Janab 2, Muqaddim Al-Hal Al-Siyasi Fi Suriya, Am Sayada'a Shurud Jadida Lil-Harub Fi Suriya, Ba'd Ma Fashil Janab 1, Wal-Atraf Li Fiha Kant Fiha Qatar Wa Turkiya Bil-Harub Ala Al-Arud, Wa Dukhul Saudi Al-An Ila Al-Harub Bikuwa Dud Al-Nizam. Hal say anjah Janab 2 Fi Al-Hal Al-Siyasi Am Sayakun well, uh, as I said, I, I think that it will be a process and not an event. It will be more like the Oslo process than a decisive day or weekend or week or five weeks. It will take a long time and there will be two steps forward, one step back. Sometimes one step forward, two steps back. But. It can only lead in one direction, that's my point. And one by one, the Gulf countries that you refer to will have to change their tune. And one of them, Qatar, maybe, is beginning already to change its tune. I I'm not allowed to go to Qatar. Uh, it's the only Arab country I can't uh, enter. I have no, I'm not carrying their flag, but I'm sure because they are the most sensitive of the antenna that you will see them as the first Gulf country to begin to change its tune. Yes, the gentleman in the striped shirt behind. Alaq Basharouj, Kuliyat Al-Idara, Suriya Tamar Fi Azma Hadda, Siyasiyan wa Askariyan. Min ba'da tashirid shaab wa damar watan. Ma hiya ru'i al-mustaqbaliya lati tattakhiza al-hukuma al-Suriya la'aat al-aman wa al-aman. وكيف يمكن لهذه الحكومة في حال صدت على الوضع أن تعيد الدماء أن تعيد الأعمار للبلاد للبلد ونعش الاقتصاد؟ Well, uh, the Syrian state has survived. That's the first and most important thing, and it's not now going to break. Therefore, Syria will be one country. It will still have people in the north and in the east, armed elements controlling some territory. It will still have explosions from time to time on the Algerian model, which will be very bloody and very destructive and will take lives. But the tide has turned and the state has proved victorious. How economically Syria can reconstruct itself 
will depend on the attitude of investors and traders of all kinds. The Syrian people, in my experience, are very good with money. They are very good at business. They will, with their new generation, rebuild their country. They have important friends in the world. Russia is a great power, becoming greater. China will soon be the greatest power of them all. So I have faith that the Syrian people will rise above the terrible place which this war has brought them to now. But I reiterate the point I made earlier. There must be democratic change in Syria. We cannot go back to the status quo ante before this war. Patriotic opposition forces currently in Damascus or outside, but who will have to be brought back to Damascus, will have to share power. And there will have to be democratic elections, a new constitution. Of course, the president will serve his term. No one can insist that the president of Syria goes. The Syrian people would not allow this in any case. But there has to be a new era for Syria. The era of one-party rule is finished there and it's finished everywhere. My main concern is the well-being, number one, of the Syrian people. But secondly, the preservation of the Arab nationalist character of Syria, which understands that the Arabs are one from Marrakesh to Bahrain, that they are one people, and that until they find some unity amongst themselves, they will always be divided and weak, and the others will steal their things. It's not because I'm with Bashar. I have nothing to do with the Syrian regime. The Syrian regime never gave me one piece of bread, ever. It's not because I want to see the preservation of the Ba'ath Party or any other party anywhere in the Arab world. I just want the Arabs to realize they are one people and not to be slaves to those who are stealing from them. And that's the real reason that Western governments hate Bashar, because he's not a slave, because he is an Arab, and because at this very, very bad situation, he has stood up for dignity and sovereignty in a very important Arab country. This has been George Galloway, Kalima Hurra, where every word has the right to be free, here on Al Mayadeen Television at the Islamic University in Lebanon. Thank you all very much.